One of the most satisfying parts of any narrative is the moment when the heroes finally overcome the antagonist, and Final Fantasy, as a franchise, has delivered many moments like this throughout its history. Cloud finally defeating Sephiroth, the fall of Kefka, and Noctis fulfilling his prophecy and putting an end to Arden. Each comes to mind when thinking of climactic battles as they were each moments where the narrative buildup was well worth the payoff. These sorts of conclusions are often saved for the big bads of any given title, but that's not to say that there haven't also been fulfilling smaller arcs with secondary and tertiary antagonists. In fact, sometimes it was these encounters that offered some of the series' most emotionally memorable moments. From time to time though, despite narrative foreshadowing, conflicts with antagonists didn't wind up in a grand showdown. Whether this is because these characters simply direct others from the sidelines, preferring not to get involved, or they're killed off by someone else at some point. Some antagonists do in fact manage to avoid a beatdown from the player. And it's those foes that we're going to focus on today. The antagonists that we never got to fight, regardless of how much it was foreshadowed or desired. These are characters that definitely seemed like someone we thought we'd have to deal with eventually, only to find out that we were mistaken. So, with the usual caveat that we're only featuring one character per title, here are seven iconic antagonists we never got to fight. And to start things off, let's take a look at one of the more popular entries from Final Fantasy VII, Sung. As the Shinra Electric Company's special espionage division, the Turks had a dark and secret history. They would pursue Cloud and his allies across the world, and the party would end up encountering them numerous times, with some of these instances having narrative significance and others leading to boss encounters. The initial interaction would take place after Cloud crashed through the roof of the Sector 4 church. The Turks, with Reno as their representative, would appear to try and apprehend Aerith, but things wouldn't go quite according to plan as Cloud stepped up to act as Aerith's bodyguard. After this sequence, Reno would be encountered many more times and the party would also square off against Rude and Elena, but one member of the Turks, their leader, Sung, would remain elusive. Sung would first be seen during the gripping sequence where Shinra was attempting to drop one of the plates. Seen from afar, he had kidnapped Aerith and retreated while Reno and Rude were left to deal with the riffraff. It would be a similar situation within the Mithril Mines, as Sung held back and let the player fight against Elena. Based on these encounters, it was clear that the Turks knew how to fight, as in spite of having no physical enhancements, they were very skilled martial artists. And if Reno, Rude and Elena were tough adversaries, it was assumed that Sung would be even tougher. By the time the party arrived at the Temple of the Ancients, it felt as though a direct conflict with Sung was finally on the cards. The Turks had found their way into the temple following Ketchi's betrayal and theft of the Keystone, and the party was in hot pursuit. But that was not the case. In lieu of a fight, Cloud and Aerith instead found Song badly wounded. They would learn that the injury had been dealt by Sephiroth, and Song then informed them that their goals were aligned. The Turks were also attempting to defeat Sephiroth. Before heading inside, Song and Aerith then shared a brief moment as they reflected on how long they had known each other. With Song in no shape to do battle, or even stand, his fate was left ambiguous in the original release and depending on the interpretation, it was even suggested that he might have died following the destruction of the temple. This was then proven to be untrue by his appearance in Advent Children, as he was seen alongside Elena. But again, we did not get to see Song fight. Indeed, the only entry to see Song in any kind of action was before Crisis, where he could be fought against in the game's training mode, but who knows whether that will be rectified within either Final Fantasy VII Rebirth or the final entry into the trilogy. Of all the corrupt leaders that have made appearances in the Final Fantasy franchise, Final Fantasy X's Maester Micah has to be one of the most two-faced and selfish. As the spiritual leader of Spira's Church of Yevon, Maester Micah, on the surface at least, was the friendly, elderly face of the faith to the people. In reality, Micah's true identity and ambitions were much more selfish and insidious, just like the Church of Yevon itself. 
Because of his role in the church and Spira's culture, it therefore seemed obvious that Micah would eventually come into direct conflict with Titus and the party as they became increasingly more at odds with the Church of Yevon in their quest to rid the world of sin. Following the death of Maester Seymour at Macalania Temple, the party's new status as outlaws of the faith would only serve to deepen this fallout with the church, increasing this likelihood. While Titus was always suspicious of Micah, it wasn't until encountering him in Bevel during Una's ill-fated wedding to the now unsent Seymour that Maester Micah revealed to the party that he was also unsent and had been for a very long time. Due to a deep-held belief that he was the only one who could lead the Church of Yevon on its mission to delude the poor people of Spira about the hopelessness surrounding sin, and indeed the calm, Maester Micah persisted to exist after death as an unsent in order to cement his influence, an influence he maintained with an iron fist. Micah accomplished this behind the scenes, as he was adverse to getting explicitly involved. As a result, his arm's length way of dealing with issues he deemed dangerous to the Church of Yevon kept him from engaging with Titus and the party directly, instead opting to let them continue with their quest knowing full well that they would eventually have to contend with the formidable Lady Unaleska if they continued. Against all odds, Titus and the party would then go on to defeat Unaleska. Upon learning this news, Michael was sent into a state of despair, believing that the ruse he had tried so hard to maintain would begin to unravel, and Spira would fall into absolute ruin as a result. But instead of transforming, as we had seen other unsent individuals do, to try and make the party pay for their transgressions, Micah decided to leave the world of his own volition, never engaging with the party directly and leaving behind a legacy of lies. In the build-up to Final Fantasy XIII, Spotlight was placed on numerous protagonists and antagonists, and one of the more intriguing was Jill Nabart. As the leader of the Psycom forces, Jill Nabart had a unique position of power within the Society of Cocoon and worked closely with the Primarch Galenth Disley. Here, her particular brand of cruelty and ambition was rewarded, making her an enemy many would have jumped at the chance to vanquish. Jill was present when Sars's son was branded by a foul sea, and she convinced Sars to hand over his son for testing by appearing understanding and sympathetic. As Daj was then bestowed with the ability to locate beings from Pulse, Jill intended to use him as a tool to find potential pulseless sea invaders of Cocoon. By the time Sars encountered Jill again, she had abandoned the facade, and was a lot less understanding of Sars's new predicament. Showing him that it was Vanille and Fang who were to blame for his son's transformation, she offered him the chance of killing Vanille himself or letting Psycom handle it. Either way, the result would be the same. Following the awakening of Sars's idol on Brynhilda, Jill took the opportunity to incapacitate Sars and capture Vanille, planning to bring the pair to the Psycom ship, the Palamecia, and have them publicly executed as Pulse Lassie. However, Lightning and the remaining party members stormed the Palamecia, rescuing Sars and Vanille in the process before heading to confront Galenth Disley. And it was at this point it felt like Sars would finally get his revenge on Jill, as she quickly jumped in to defend the Primarch. Disley, as it turned out, had other ideas. Choosing that moment to reveal himself as the Falci Bartandalus, he wished to talk to the Lucy directly, and felt that Jill had played out her usefulness in his schemes. As such, he struck Jill down with magic, discarding her without a second thought. It wouldn't be until the release of Final Fantasy XIII 2 that players would finally get to test Jill's battle prowess. As part of the game's downloadable content, this saw Jill feature as one of the characters the player could fight against in the Colosseum, and she could even be recruited to the player's party. Now, over the years, there have been numerous Final Fantasy characters who have embodied their now iconic roles, but few are as overlooked or forgotten as the Dark Knight Leon from Final Fantasy II. And this is a real shame considering he is one of the earliest examples of a bad guy players loved to hate and wanted to see get their comeuppance. Meant by Square to be the first playable antagonist, Leo was part of the player's party at the very beginning of the game, but he went missing after the group was overrun by the Palamecian Empire's Black Knights. While it seemed like this might be the end of Leon's story, it turned out that Leon was not killed in the attack. Instead, he was captured, turned into a Dark Knight, and made a powerful figure within the Palamecian military. Acting as the Emperor's lackey, Leon was a competent and power-hungry thorn in the side of Firion and the party as they attempted to thwart the efforts of the Empire. He would be charged with overseeing the Empire's Dreadnought project, a heavily fortified combat airship, 
but he was also directly responsible for the enslavement of the people of Basque and the destruction of the towns of Poft, Altair and Gatria. A showdown with Firion therefore seemed inevitable. After all, the player had been well primed to find the Dark Knight just as despicable and detestable as other high-ranking officials in the Empire such as Borgen and the Emperor himself. But things would take a different path. Firion and his allies would be able to take down the Dreadnought without a single blow being exchanged between them and Leon. It was during the destruction of the Dreadnought that Maria recognised the Dark Knight's true identity as her brother. In the events that followed, and up until the first defeat of the Emperor of Palamecia, Firion continued to cross paths with Leon as a Dark Knight, but never actually ended up coming to blows. In the end, Leon would eventually rejoin the player's party in order to defeat the Emperor once and for all in Pandemonium, effectively putting a lid on the chance of fighting him in a head-on encounter for the remainder of the game. What's really interesting here though is that in the original scenario of Final Fantasy II, Leon was actually intended to be a boss fight. The fight was going to occur during the Wyvern Egg questline as part of the main story, but it was scrapped for the final release. Emperor Gastal was an ambitious monarch with a penchant for conquering his neighbours, and due to the integral role he played in the fate of Final Fantasy VI's world, he would become an iconic villain. The ruler of the Castalian Empire, Emperor Gastal was a calculating and cunning leader with an eye for military strategy. Coming to power well before the events of Final Fantasy VI, Gastal was responsible for turning the city of Vector into a metropolis. This was only built on the newly invented Magitech technology which he created alongside his chief scientist Sid following the Empire's invasion of the Esper world. While Magitech brought prosperity to the people of Vector, it also had a darker side as a tool of war, and Gastal used this to great effect in conquering neighbouring kingdoms and extending the Empire's influence. From these weapon advances also came the terrible Kefka, a human who had been infused with magic through human experimentation and driven mad as a result, and who operated as Gestal's de facto personal super soldier. As the largest and most powerful military force in the world of balance, the Empire's machinations and Kefka had run afoul of nearly every member of the main cast and the resistance operation known as the Returners. Terra, for example, sought her revenge against Gestal first due to his involvement in kidnapping her as a child from the Esper world, and second for forcing her to commit extreme acts of violence as an Imperial Magitic soldier against her will. Sadly, stories like Terra's were all too common in the world of balance. While it appeared as though a battle against Emperor Gestal was therefore bound to happen at some point, the encounter never materialised. Instead, after heading to Vector following the reopening of the Cave of Espers, Returners found the city ravaged, Kefka imprisoned, and the Emperor willing to do work with them to achieve a peace accord with the Espers rather than fight. Of course, this eventually proved to be nothing more than a ruse, with Gestal betraying both the Returners and the Espers and attempting to steal the power of the warring triad for himself. This hubris proved to be Gestal's undoing, as it turned out that Kefka had different plans. Having grown increasingly agitated, Kefka struck Gestal down and pushed him from the floating continent to his death, putting an end to Gestal's rule and in turn saving the player a boss fight against a magically imbued geriatric. Malevolent and manipulated monarchs have frequently featured as early to mid-game antagonists for the player's party to overcome, and Queen Bronn fits that description to a T. The queen of the kingdom of Alexandria, Bram was also the adoptive mother of Princess Garnet, having brought her into the royal family following the death of her own daughter. Supposedly, Bram was once a kind and benevolent ruler, but following the death of her husband, this side of her became seen less and less. Instead, Bram became a loud and boisterous leader, and was often depicted planning, participating in and calling for all manner of atrocities from murder and subterfuge to even more extreme things like war and genocide. And this was all in service of her expansionist agenda, a far cry from her kind and caring former self. The source of these changes? None other than the diabolical Kuja. Operating under his own designs, Kuja had manipulated Queen Bran behind the scenes, encouraging her imperialistic desires. And he was also willing to offer a helping hand, as it was Kuja who showed Bran how to create the Black Mage Army, which she then used to invade and conquer other nations in search of the Crystal Shards and powerful Eidolons. This thirst for power even led Bran to attempt to extract Eidolons from her daughter, who was actually a member of the same tribe as summoners as Iko, 
and she did so because she wanted to use them as weapons, even if the price to pay was her daughter's life. As her plans effectively posed a threat to every single living being on Gaia, Sedan's party and Queen Braun ran up against each other on numerous occasions, such as the game's introductory moments in the Kingdom of Burmesia, at Clara, and Lindblom. It was never Queen Braun herself that the party dealt with though, as she often opted to send in others to do her dirty work. Using the Black Mages, the Black Waltzes, Zorn and Thorn, Beatrix, and powerful Eidolons like Atmos, Odin, and Bahamut, Queen Braun repeatedly used all the weapons and personnel at her disposal to get what she wanted. This selfish and singular approach would end up being her downfall. After the defection of the Black Mage army, she blamed Kuja, and thought it wise to go head to head with her longtime co-conspirator and arms dealer. Usurping her control of Bahamut and turning the Eidolon against her, Kuja killed Queen Braun off the coast of the Outer Continent, removing any chance for a showdown between her and the player, though one would be hard pressed to call her bombastic end anticlimactic or undeserved. That then brings us onto the final entry of this list, and because it relates to Final Fantasy XVI, we're going to include a pretty big spoiler warning here. To repeat, if you have not finished the game, you should avert your gaze now. Final Fantasy XVI featured some rather intense villains, but none have quite the same level of infamy as Annabella Rossfield. First encountered within the prologue, within just a few scenes it was already clear how cruel and calculating Annabella was. She did little to hide the disdain she felt for Clive, and that was just the tip of the iceberg, as Annabella would soon bring down the entire duchy while also sending her firstborn son into slavery. Years later, we would learn that Annabella's conniving had not ceased. If anything, it had thrived. Regular population purges of Rosaria were carried out in her name, and Annabella would also manipulate not just Hugo Kupka, but Emperor Sylvester himself, with the strong relationship that existed between the Emperor and his son, Dion, serving as yet another piece of collateral damage. Each of these actions was fueled by flawed ideologies. Annabella strove for perfection and admonished and discarded anything that did not live up to her perceived standards. For years, Clive would wear physical scars that served as a testament to the desires and whims of Annabella, and due to how despicable her actions were, the player would have wanted to hand out some form of retribution. As Clive then ventured forth the twin side, there was a sense that this retribution would be delivered, as after being awoken by the destructive power of an enraged Bahamut, Clive navigated his way towards the city centre, and it was here that he stumbled upon his mother, Annabella. The pair exchanged some angry and bitter words before they were interrupted by Joshua flying through the walls of the building they were in. They then continued this conversation after Bahamut had been quelled and Olivier had been vanquished. By this point, Annabella was hysterical. Her plans were in ruins and everything she had worked so hard towards had crumbled before her eyes. Even though Clive and Joshua still appeared to be forgiving, this represented the perfect opportunity for Annabella to further dig the knife in and prove how unredeemable she was. But what happened next was therefore quite shocking, as Annabella instead opted to end her own life, as despite her two sons still being alive and well, she felt there was nothing left worth living for. And with that, they were seven iconic antagonists that we never got to fight. Are there any that we missed that you would have loved to take down a peg? Please share in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, feel free to hit that like button and subscribe for more. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Adam Aguilara, Arguan, Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Gaussian Di Kajata, Gregory, Justin Dent and Sukun TDK, who are super special Onion Knight supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.